Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Adobe Live. Happy Monday. Hope you've had a great weekend and that you're coming into the week all refreshed and ready to learn loads of new stuff. Now, if you're watching us on YouTube, that's just fine. You can do that there. But if you want to get involved with the community, then come along and join us on behance.net slash adobe live because that's where you can get in ask questions and get to know the fabulous people that make up our community here in the uk and today we're joined by one of our favorites we're joined by the amazing joe ellum how are you doing joe hello thank you uh you're too kind tony um oh man you're great uh, we love having you here it's always fun on the streams so happy to be back no, we're happy to have you here. So uh, we're going to be uh, speaking to you more in just a moment. But first, let's give a shout out to some of the people that we've got joining us. It's great that we have so many regulars uh, here every day, which is really good. Hi, Sean. Uh, guten Tag. Uh, hi, Kirsty. Uh, hi to Sandrine. We've got Sandrine here. Uh, we've also got Julia, the host from Germany, my great, great friend, Julia Seegers here uh, with us. Hi, Julia. Uh, we've got Tim in the background, of course, as always. Uh, I think I mentioned Sandrine a moment ago. We've got Robert Brock here. We've got, uh, let's have a look. We've got Gareth. Hi, Gareth. And Andreas. Uh, guten Tag, uh, Andreas. It's great that people watch the German stream and then they just hungry for more straight on over to here which is fantastic so there we go quite a few richard alexandra and alexander sorry uh, and a few more i feel like i'm reading the birthday club on kids tv <laughs> right now to be perfectly honest but there we go and we'll speak to you a bit more uh, as we go through so joe tell us what are you going to be sharing with us today uh today we're going to be going through lightroom um so nice. it's been requested quite a few times in previous streams uh i'm kind of one of those types of creatives who's kind of you know dipping my hands in all the different pots of honey and um when it comes to my online content i'm quite often known for um photography stuff and i primarily make videos about photography um so yeah there's been a lot of requests to go through lightroom and i'm happily going to show some of my workflows um, just got a few images on the screen now just to kind of give you an idea of the type of images I take so it's quite often a um, like a travel urban sort of theme to a lot of things and um, generally my sort of style is quite relaxed and almost um, I guess kind of like the how do you put it like the candid lifestyle stuff I'm not really going for those epic huge like bangers of images um and generally just want to be quite relatable in capturing the everyday life um those are the types of things that i look forward to to shooting cool. um yeah so I've there's got, some lovely shots there thanks uh i've got a collection of images that um i can run through on how i've edited them and kind of go through all the, the edit settings and whatever um and likewise, I'm open for people to, you know, list their comments and questions on things. And we can see, you know, if I've got images of a particular style that maybe people want to know about how I would tackle. Um, and then I've got a lot of raw images that we can go through and uh, choose a couple or, or however many we get through to edit and uh, see how they work. Fab. Well, we're getting some questions in already, actually. Kirsty, straight in with what presets do you use? on your images. I dare say we'll find that out uh, shortly. Uh, and Julia's saying great photos. Uh, Andreas is saying great shots. Uh, fantastic. So yeah, great crisp imagery, says Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Uh, so yeah, great, Joe. Take it away. Cool. All right, let's jump into... So I'm going to be using Lightroom Classic. 
Yeah. Um, I do actually chop and change between Lightroom and Lightroom Classic, um, but my preference is still for importing my footage, uh, importing my images through Lightroom Classic. Uh, I think it just offers more control and um, there's a lot more flexibility on things like file renaming um, and just positioning of storing it on local drives. Yeah. Uh, so this is actually my 2019 library and I generally create a new library for each year. Um, it's just a way to stay organized because um, it can just get a little bit, you know, crazy with the amount of images that we have, um, like tens and sometimes even hundreds of thousands of images. And I'd rather be kind of localized per year on my images. Um, haven't really been anywhere this year. So 2019 is the best library to show. Um, so let's, uh, let's take a start with um, some edited images already. Um, so we've got a collection here. So we've got some things like some winter shots, um, some kind of railways, a few people ones. Uh, let's choose. It's great no, that we're getting for... to see all of these as you go through, by the way. I'm going to go for this one. I think this okay. is kind of a quite an interesting image. Uh, so just want to make sure, can everyone uh, hopefully see the screen all good in terms of... Yeah, we can hear. I believe so. Uh, yeah. All right. So from the beginning, this image, uh, if we go into our develop module at the top, this image looked like this. Um, so just by pressing the backslash key on the keyboard, you can chop and change between before and after. So you can see that the style that I went for um, as a final result kind of enhanced some of the warmer tones towards the center of the, the key focus of this street vendor. Uh, this is in Taipei, by the way. Um, and then I sort of accentuated the colder tones around the edge of the image, um, kind of draws people in. And I really love shooting at night, especially in uh, around Asia, because so many of the night markets and just the life itself in the cities always comes alive. Um, so they're usually pretty well lit, even though the surrounding area is dark. And I think it just adds such a sort of atmosphere to, to the environment. Um, and it's also just when I'm most active, I'm definitely a night person. <laughs> so I think I'm, I'm just more in tune with what I'm actually looking at. Um, so let's go through. We've got it's challenges games. though, right? Shooting at night like that with noise. Yeah, and... yeah definitely. Um, especially, uh, and at the time with these, I was making video as well. Um, so at the same time as taking these photos, I'm making videos about how I take the images and where I'm taking them. Um, and it can be pretty tricky just to kind of focus on what it is that you're trying to say. But at the same time, because there's so much happening, no one really notices. They don't really bat an eyelid. There's, there's so much going on. Um, and the other thing I guess that is always missing from these images is just the fantastic smell of the food. Um, it just, it smells tasty everywhere. Mm. And I wish that could translate through, but you just have to take my word for it. <laughs> Maybe in the future. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I guess what I can run through is I can just show an example um, of what I've got here that I edited, and then we can go through and, and edit one from scratch. So, starting off with, uh, the great thing with Lightroom, obviously, is that all your controls are pretty much in an order of preference that you would take as you edit down. Um, so, the white balance, if I double click onto it, we can see what it was originally and what I've adjusted it to. Um, so I've just kind of cooled the temperature down ever so slightly. Uh, and if we were to sort of re-accentuate it, you can see the difference that happens here. Mm. Um, and of course, this is the benefit of shooting raw. You get a full control of things like color temperature. Um, coming down into more of the tone settings. So the exposure I've dropped, uh, which again, it's a night image. So you'd kind of be surprised to think that I'm actually darkening it. Um, so if we go back to what the original was, this is how it would kind of look, but I've dropped the darkness down and I'll show you why in a moment. And likewise, I quite often bring the contrast back 
Um, mm. Again, in night images where you've got a lot of bright lights and dark areas, you're naturally getting contrast in your image. And as you go through and produce edits and kind of manipulate things, you're almost always going to be introducing more contrast throughout what it is that you're editing. Um, so just bringing it back from the very start actually helps in the long run. Um, and quite often I do actually come back to the contrast slider at the very end and still adjust it and bring it back. Uh, so highlights and shadows wise, you can see I'm bringing down the highlights quite a way um, and I'm increasing the shadows quite a way. So if we were to reset both of those, uh, you can see how it just doesn't quite have that life to the image. Um, of course, this is still showing some of the other edits we've got, but you can see how those individual sliders are having some effect. Um, if we just go back to how they were. By increasing some of the shadow areas, so if we just have a look here, you can see it's those in between, they're sort of visible and they're bright, but they're not they're not illuminated as such. So like areas around like lower of the, the stand. Um, so increasing that kind of brings enough of a intrigue into knowing what the scene is, but it's not causing too much distraction. If I was to bring it all the way up, it's just gonna kind of ruin the image a bit too much. Uh, and likewise with the highlights, the image originally uh, has kind of clipped, well, it's not quite clipped on the highlights, but it's, it's captured them very bright. Um, so I just kind of tone those down uh, and it really helps just to bring back the detail. Um, so you can really see the, the difference specifically on this area here. Um, yeah, that's actually quite a significant mm. amount. Uh, I'm just hoping these images are going to load smoothly. This has actually been referenced from uh, my server behind me because this is all... No, it all appears image, to but... be coming across okay. And it's and actually, okay, cool. um, Sean's actually answering questions uh, for you in a couple of places. Someone was asking about, uh, I think, about the exposure on this particular shot or the, or the settings for this particular shot. And Sean's actually managed to bag them from the bottom of the screen there and push them across to... Uh, yeah, super that's... Handy. Uh, that's a good point, actually. So yeah, this mm. was shot with my Fujifilm X-H1 um, mm. using the 35 f2. Uh, if you don't know that lens, by the way, it's probably my favorite uh, of the Fuji lenses. It's, it's super small, incredibly sharp, um, and it's also a weather-sealed lens, so I, I quite often shoot in the rain with it, and I've got no issues with that at all. Um, and we're at one, six, one 160th of a second shut speed, uh, an ISO of 640. So a fairly um, modest sort of settings, really. I'm not doing too long an exposure. Um, 1 60th of a, 1 100th of the 60th is something I could quite easily do in daytime as well. Um, so we're not really pushing the boundaries too hard here. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these sliders, uh, but some of the, the key ones to point out. Uh, so clarity, this is kind of a, an interesting one. It's a way, the way that I think of clarity is it's a bit like um, the the cross between contrast and sharpening um, and then a bit of maths to work out what you actually want. <laughs> it's it's kind of like a, a way to bring out some detail without cooking your image to a crisp. It's a super um, handy uh, thing, clarity. Have you? Do you ever use negative clarity on people shots? Where you, have you ever used yeah, those to soften sometimes. them out? Mm. Yeah, it can really help with like um, just skin tones and things that can look unnatural to the eye, I guess. Um, but for the most part, I actually I don't do very many close-ups of people. It's it's always an area that I want yeah. to be better at. Um, I think I recall you saying before, actually, on an earlier, earlier yeah, life. I think hmm. it's um, I don't know. There's there's just something there's something I I just admire about portrait photographers who have this immediate connection between them and someone else with a camera in between them. Um, it's so difficult to to kind of bridge that connection. I find and. I think that's just going to be a lifelong goal to always be better at getting pictures of people. Um, but I guess it's, it's all part of the challenge, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And Sandrine, by the way, calls it micro contrast. That's a good, uh, good analogy, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of exactly it. It's, uh, 
the tiniest bits. Um, moving on, so vibrance and saturation. Um, so for those of you who are unaware of the difference between those, because they do kind of sound like the same thing, vibrance is um, kind of like a uh, kind of like saturation, but with some maths involved to protect some of the more unnatural things such as skin tones um, and those sort of warmer tones that can very quickly oversaturate. Um, and if we were to adjust this further, so you can see at the moment I had it about plus 12 or so. If we go all the way up, it's making the more, it's making the image more vibrant, but in some of the areas more so than others. Um, and likewise, if we bring it all the way down to zero, there's still color in the image. Whereas if we do the same on the saturation, bring it all the way up and everything's just way too much. Um, it's yeah, just not very pleasant at all. And if we bring it all the way down to zero, um, the majority of the color is now removed and we've still got some blue there, but that is likely due to uh, some extra uh, settings I've got further down the stack. Um, then we have the tone curve. This is perhaps probably where most of the character for an image comes about. Um, so this is how you can sort of like adjust your contrasts and where you're bringing uh, your shadows down, your highlights up. So as a example of how to explain this, if you're new to um, curves, because it can be a, a bit of an abstract view on your image. Think of this bottom left area is everything that is black is black. And up here in your top right, everything that is white is white. And then across, so we have a scale of from black to white and likewise from black to white across uh, your X and Y axis. So everything in the bottom left um, across the X axis that's black, we can lift up and we can brighten it. And you see how that just goes awfully disgusting. Super solarized, yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and likewise, everything in the top right, we can bring down to darken. Yep. Um, so you'll notice that if we look into what I've done here, it's actually quite subtle, um, but we're darkening some of the, the shadow areas, uh, adjusting the midpoint. So the midpoint's actually coming brighter slightly. If we adjust it, you can see how only the smallest movements are really making some sort of effect here. Uh, and then towards the mid to highs, um, we're just raising them, but then I'm bringing the highlights down just a teeny bit. So we never actually get that pure white um, so it just kind of stops it from clipping too much uh, and maintains like a bit of warmth into an image. Likewise, into the um, individual colors, we've mm. got the reds, greens, and blues. Um, so we've got some adjustments here and that just kind of adds more sort of um, like character to the image. So if we were to move this red around, you can see how it really just sort of shifts. Um, and you can spend hours and hours going through the tone curve. So I'm going to Try not is to there a parametric that. curve in Lightroom Classic? I can't remember if there is. Is there a parametric uh, alternative? I don't believe you do actually have any no. any other. Um, the curves is actually an area that I've consistently given feedback on that I want it to be bigger. Um, so whilst we're on Adobe's channel, uh, <laughs> I want it to. I just want big, like granular scale. Um, it, it used to be that they would present that dialogue at exactly 256 pixels across so that it mapped ah, all the 256 sense. levels that you've got there. Yeah. So nobody could argue that it was in some way not accurate by being anything larger or interpolated oh. up. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. I, I understand what you mean. I, I, I think that the 256 is probably a good idea still, but what I do think would be nice, um, is maybe if there was a magnified overview that you could see. Mm -hmm. So you're still adjusting within that, but the, the magnified overview helps because it is it is tricky. Yeah. No, that's that's actually, I'm glad to hear that there is uh, a rationale behind that. Yeah. 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 That makes perfect sense. I like the way it does it on mobile, actually, because it overlays it on the screen. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's so easy to just do it and you can tap and hold um, to remove any sort of uh, edits that you've done. Um, cool, moving on, we've yep. got the HSL sliders, so hue, saturation, luminance. Um, you can see that I'm just kind of tweaking some of these colors here. 
Um, so I'm adjusting some of the blues to be a little bit more green. And if we move that around, you can see kind of in this area around behind. Um, and likewise, some of the purples and magentas just sort of warming them a little bit. Um, and then here's where we start to get control over how I'm creating this cooler effect in areas and warmer in others. So the saturation on the reds is probably the most prominent here. If I was to bring that back up, um, you can see how it draws just a bit too much of a, a warmth and interest on the sign, whereas yeah. the key focus really is this guy. Um, so I'm kind of like dropping that down a bit. Uh, and likewise, I could even drop the luminance down and see how it just kind of darkens it without it being... Uh, in fact, I do actually But specifically that. <laughs> in that range, which is really, really helpful, right? It's really yeah, good. definitely. Yeah. Um, um, by the way, just, just quickly, Oliver uh, is saying that there is a parametric um, curve available in uh, Lightroom, and it's a small squiggle that you can click uh, to turn it. So can you see next to the channel? You can do that, and then you've got a parametric range there, so you can work specifically in those ranges, which uh, is helpful sometimes. So yeah, there you go. Uh, I guess yeah, thanks, Oliver. Quicker adjustments. Um, I personally always prefer a, uh, a pinpoint focus. Yeah, I very much doubt you'd need to change, but I'm, I was just thinking about the people who may maybe just coming along to this for the first time and mm. just to help it help it along. But, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Anyway, it sorry. <laughs> guides you through it a little bit more. No, that's yeah. good. Good tip. Um, da, da, da. Yeah, so I quite often just make my adjustments here, and there's uh, a feature within here that I use all the time. And you see this little button here. It's kind of like a, a target selection. Yep. So if we click onto that, this one's now active. I can now, over my image, choose an area, uh, and it will highlight. You see how it's just adjusting uh, which of the sliders I'm pointed at. So if we highlight over here the blue, I can just click and drag on the image and I can actually adjust those individual colors. Um, you see it adjusting the slider. Yep. Shifting all so of those very hues. very easily yep. pinpoint those parts um, that need to kind of be adjusted. Uh, and that is kind of the, the quickest way of just going through and rapidly doing um, your adjustments. You can also tab through the keyboard shortcuts, um, but I still find um, I'm actually still more productive using the mouse. Uh, it's kind of a a rarity because almost all other applications I'm like 90% on the keyboard but for Lightroom it's I don't know I, I still find that mouse control is is more delicate for me um, split toning this is uh, again where you can get a lot of character from your image so essentially here we're choosing what tone direction we want to push our highlights and what tone direction we want to push our shadows so I'm actually doing nothing with the highlights here. So the, the saturation to my tonal adjustment is zero. Um, but in the shadows, I'm moving my shadows towards like a, a bluer area. So again, all of these darker areas, they're going to have an increase in a, a blue sort of hue um, with this saturation. If I drag it down and drag it up, you can see how it's um, making some adjustment. And again, when I'm doing these adjustments, I'm quite often going like all the way one way and then all the way back and then just finding the balance in between that I feel comfortable and fits yeah. my taste. Uh, we've got some sharpening detail here. Um, and I'm, yeah, adding in some sharpening. Uh, the radius is how much of the, the pixel size you're targeting on where you're applying your sharpening to. Um, and then a masking is within that radius of what it is that you're kind of protecting. So you can sort of correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you can increase the detail and the radius and increase the masking and you're kind of working on it's a bigger area but of, in a finer yeah, point. Targets yeah. it. Do, do you want to know my analogy for um, for the sharpening tab uh, yeah, just there for or for the way that it works or the way to understand radius? Um, by the way, the number one mistake people make when they're using this particular panel is they need to be at 100% or above in order to be able to see the results we're doing it. But the way I think of it for radius is imagine that you have a house with a garden, a, a semi-detached house, right? So there's a, a neighbor next to you with a garden and maybe part of your fence is falling down and they've got lovely flowers on the other side. And so you talk to your neighbor and you agree just how much you can come into their garden to work on your fence. And that gives you the radius. It's sort of the area they're saying, right, well, I only want you one foot away from, 
from there because otherwise you're going to damage my insert plant name here yeah, yeah. and so that's your radius your radius is one foot uh -huh. along the entire length that's the way i look at it yeah, strange garden analogy good. i know but <laughs> <laughs> To be honest, I thought you were going to go down the direction of your pencils, talking about you. Do you know I should have done with the 2,000 pencils I've got in here, honestly, but I'm just, uh, oh, I don't know, I'm such a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> if only I had a longer neck. <laughs> anyway. All right. Um, I mean, we could Photoshop a Brontosaurus into this. Um, that would be hilarious. You see, that's trip. where that's what I would definitely do. Definitely. <laughs> Uh, okay, moving on from the sharpening. So we got into uh, noise reduction here. Uh, now, of course, this is a night image, and that is you know, prime for having noise in your image. The, the hotter your sensor gets on the ISO, um, the more uh, noise you're going to introduce. Noise being like a, a digital grain um, and sort of bad manipulation of pixels on your on your image. Um, it should also be noted, though, that having a higher or even a lower ISO doesn't necessarily control or introduce uh, noise. So for example, you could shoot um, a night image and increase your ISO and you get a, a overall better exposure uh, with limited noise. Whereas if you were to shoot that image with an idea of keeping your ISO at 100 or 200, chances are you're actually going to have more noise because when you brighten that image in post-production um, because it's not exposed correctly, you're going to be digitally um, adding after effects and, and kind of messing it up. Uh, so the more you can do in camera towards a correct exposure, even if that includes increasing the ISO, you're actually going to get a better result afterwards. Um, I think that's quite a, a common fear that people have of don't raise the ISO. Um, but these days cameras are are so good um, at having high ISOs and even cameras having decent native ISOs that are higher than uh, your lower format and um, shooting at that native ISO is going to be where the sensor is perfectly designed um, to operate at. So I'm doing some noise reduction here uh, and again we've got detail sliders and uh, abilities to increase smoothness and, and whatever. Um, we've got uh, automatic options here for chromatic aberration and uh, profile corrections. Unfortunately, Lightroom doesn't actually support uh, Fujifilm lens profiles. Um, so there aren't actually any built in uh, for the uh, Fujifilm lenses that I use. Um, oh, wow. I can do it on my X100F, but yeah, not for any of my other ones. So there's not a lot I can do there really. Um, but if you do have a camera that supports it, so most major ones such as Canons, Nikons, uh, even some Sony cameras, that will just do all your automatic um, vignetting and distortion correction. Um, Cause some lenses do have a bit of a bulbous sort of image to them. Uh, let me get into some fun parts with the transform. So this is an area that I focus on a lot. Um, and I always think it, it adds a, an element to the image that is so, um, so absorbing to look at. And a lot of people can't pinpoint what it is they like about a particular image. And to me, so often it's because things like the verticals and the horizons are correct. So if we were to say, look at some of um, my other images, like uh, this one here of the skyline of Chicago, it's taken with a, um, a fairly wide angle lens, but everything is perfectly vertical. Uh, it's always fully straight. Um, all of the lines that are supposed to be going up are going up it's not angled uh, incorrectly, such as if we go back to the original, it's all kind of a little bit distorted. So everything's kind of straight and top to bottom as it should be. Um, and this is something that I focus on a lot with almost all of my images because for one, I could be wonky in the way that I'm holding the camera, um, but two, just the nature of the optics of lenses that things are always kind of bending in some way. So if we look at the original, you see how that kind of shifted yeah. Um, a little bit kind of weirdly uh, and I've actually done it this way on a guided one so we're going to adjust the uprights with the guides and with the guides I've just selected verticals and horizontals and these are kind of my reference points of the uh, focus of intent with the image that that is what I want to be perfectly flat on and you can just drag to draw your guides and 
we can uh, go through that in an image that I'm going to edit in a moment. Um, and then just enabling constraint crop, just make sure it's it's not having any sort of excess space outside the frame. Yeah, so a warp within the, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I'm applying a tiny bit of grain um, with a fairly modest roughness to it. Uh, again, if we zoom in and see what that does, uh, so we are currently at 1 to 100%. So if I drop this grain back, um, look on some of the cleaner areas, like the, the background here and the sign, and we just increase that. It kind of adds this element texture. of character and yeah, mm. like a texture and sharpness. Um, it's quite common in uh, production. You'll see it on, say, movie posters all the time. If you go and have a look at them close up, there's always a very distinct grain to an image yeah. um, and it increases the the sort of visible sharpness to an image without kind of making it too digital um, it's the I guess it's one of the characteristics of film that uh, is so hard to replicate in modern day cameras um, and funnily enough Sandrine uh, in the chat just remarked on that not too many moments ago uh, saying that what can be disappointing is when noise only happens in the blacks that you do need a bit of it everywhere. It's quite true. Yeah, quite true. That's very true. Yeah, especially an image like this where we've got uh, a wide variety of exposures. Um, yeah, it can be so distracting to have it in only one area, and mm. especially if you're looking at it on a screen, like when it's a, a digital or a backlit image. Um, sometimes it can just look too clean in places. Uh, if you were to print. Quite often, the, the print itself, the paper, will have some texture to it that can kind of bring that. Um, but again, it all comes down to personal taste. And uh, going through into the calibration, um, so I'm adjusting the tint of the shadows. So I'm making those slightly greener. Again, if we look at what this is doing, um, so it's, in my eyes, it's kind of warming up the image. I know that's not really the right term for this. Um, but you see, as we drag it to the, the green, it sort of warms those tones whereas to the magenta is kind of cooling them. Um, and I'm shifting the reds slightly. You have to be careful with this because this is kind of where the skin tones lie in a lot of places. Um, so you can see that makes things just very inaccurate. Uh, and adjusting saturation with those. But likewise, when you shift some of these uh, with the red, greens and blues, they all have an effect on each other. So you could push one only a little bit and then push the green, say, for example, hugely, and then bring it back with the blues. Um, so it kind of takes a lot of trial and error and experience to know where these calibrations are, are sort of moving. Um, and it's with a lot of these settings that cumulatively uh, I've done time and time again on multiple images um, that I've then created presets for that make it so much easier to go through and edit at a faster pace because it keeps things consistent from shoot to shoot in styles that I know that I enjoy. Yeah. Um, oh, one extra thing I completely forgot to mention. So a benefit with the Fujifilm cameras is they have a great selection of built-in film simulations. Um, when you shoot in JPEG, you can bake those simulations in and have the camera process them great. When you shoot in RAW and import them, by default, Lightroom will change your um, your color space to Adobe Standard. Um, but if we go at the very top, one of the very first things that you can do is set your profile. Um, so if we browse on here, we should be able to see all the other Fujifilm film simulations. And you can see how they adjust their sort of calibration to specific colors, and by far, my favorite is uh, Classic Chrome. I'm pretty much always shooting Classic Chrome in Fujifilm. Uh, I just think it really matches the um, uh, the sort of style I'm shooting and a lot of street images and um, it's it's just Classic Chrome. I love it. <laughs> oh, it's lovely, really lovely. Um, all right, so that's kind of like a, an in-depth look into how I edit. Oh, actually, sorry, I'm jumping away from myself here. There's more. I believe we've got some local uh, adjustments. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Mm. So I have in my uh, gradient edit over here. So I'm actually just um, so to go back to that so I didn't go too fast. So at the top here, we've got our um, 
gradient adjustment. It's like a, a filter that you can apply over a certain area of the image. So I've drawn this in and then we have local adjustments to bring down the exposure, bring down the highlights and some of the shadows. Essentially, I'm using this gradient area to just darken this guy's shoulder and neck because it's a little bit distracting as it is normally. Um, so it just comes in and we can adjust this to make sure that we're only affecting this area. If I hover over, you can see all of those areas that I'm uh, affecting and adjusting. Likewise, I could draw in another one um, and that will uh, utilize the same settings that I had previously, or I could adjust those and, and make my own adjustments such as making this very cold with a blue or anything like that. Uh, but I don't really like that, so I'm gonna delete. Um, I could have done a, uh, a radial adjustment here. Um, so on this guy, I could have drawn in and I could have darkened down the outside, um, darkened some of the highlights and just sort of drawn the, the viewer in. But I actually found that naturally the image sort of already did that, so it wasn't necessary. Um, but in a few others, I have done it on my edits as a way to draw in the focus. So if we go back to... Could you, sorry, could you just show your way back into the um, local adjustments again, just for Gareth because uh, and a yep. couple of others who are wondering about how you got to them. So here you are, Gareth. You so can see when we're in the uh, when we're in the develop module. Um, so scroll. Uh, actually, you don't even need to scroll to the top. These controls here are always uh, visible. So just below your histogram, you've got your crop control. So you can see this was the crop that I applied. Um, so that was just a way that I centralized this focus. Uh, we have our spot healing, um, so you can remove elements from an image and sample from others. Uh, this is the red eye, I believe. Yep. Um, then we have the gradient adjustment or the gradient filter, uh, which is what I was using. And when you select this, you can just draw onto the screen of where you want to make your adjustment and then make your adjustments. You'll notice it's kind of pulled this drop down over the rest of your um, edits that you already had and you can see I've got one already here um, that I'd previously done uh, and then your radial ones if you want circular same effect but in circular fashion and this final one is a giant brush um, and from here you can make your brush adjustments yeah. and similarly you can just paint into a, a particular area you can have a little bit more of a finite control and make your adjustments that way. Does, does like sorry, does Lightroom Classic? Because just remind me, because I, I, don't, I don't work in it really anymore. I, I use just Lightroom. Um, does it have uh, luminosity and range masks for the? It does. Uh, yeah. Radial adjustment. Um, yeah. And that was actually a huge feature when that got added. Yeah. Um, so at the bottom oh, yeah, here we got see. range mask. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I can show in. An edit I'm about to do actually. Um, okay, cool. That might work perfect. So, uh, so let's go to some of these raw images. Um, so I think I might actually go for this one. So this was one of my favorite images I captured last year. Um, famous view of Seattle, Space Needle, Mount Rainier. Yep. Um, yeah, just a a gorgeous place to see the sunset. Um, we got lucky here that the sky just, it just exploded with pink. Um, the whole time that we were shooting here, it just got more and more pink. Um, and this particular image is kind of the, the perfect balance of the sky being at a level of pinkness, but the foreground still having uh, enough brightness in it that I'm able to manipulate further. So the first thing I'll do when I'm about to make my adjustments is I'll make a virtual copy, which is just command and apostrophe on the keyboard. You see that's created this virtual copy. So that way I've, I've always got my original. And then this virtual copy is kind of like a, a workspace where you can work on adjustments. Um, you're never going to be damaging the original within Lightroom anyway, but I always like to have my copies uh, just so I can see progress and just maintain differences. So the virtual copy is where, when we go into our develop settings, this is where I'm going to make my adjustments. Um, by default, I have all of my images set to classic Chrome when I import them. So that edit is already made for me, um, but otherwise that's where I would change it. 
And to give you a, an idea of how it looks by standard, um, so if we go into Adobe Standard, uh, which was the old format, or Adobe Color, which is the more up-to-date, uh, mm. modernized version of the Adobe's Color Science, it looks like this. Um, and we can browse, but classic Chrome is how it looks from Fuji's uh, styling. So you see I it kind you... of go on. subtly reduces some of the saturation, yeah. I think you streamed uh, with uh, Maddie, didn't you? The Was it last week or the week before? Uh, yeah, we're going through yeah. some premiere things. That was it, yeah. Uh, Maddie and I were, were saw a sunset like that. Um, we went out on a boat in Seattle Harbour. But if you ever get the chance to do that, it's fantastic, those things. I suspect you probably have. but uh, Not at sunset, but we did take a boat to uh, Bainbridge Island. Mm. Um, there's a little brewery about 10 minutes walk from the the thing we just went straight there <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was a great place glorious. yeah yeah it, it, funny actually this uh so this trip was in march of last year um and we drove all the way from la up to seattle and oddly the the further north we got the hotter it got um and the day before here we were in uh actually a couple of days before we were in uh, rocky point in oregon mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was snowing and that caught us by surprise. And then when we got to Seattle, this was the hottest day of the year. It was like 30 degrees or something. Um, yeah, crazy. Did you but, go to the market? Did you go to the fish market? Uh, Pike Place. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I really enjoyed Seattle. It's got a, it's got a cool vibe to it. Um, so yeah, so to make my adjustments here, um, I said that I do create presets on uh, my images. So just to give you a quick overview, I'm not actually necessarily going to edit with these presets, um, but I've got my Urban Chrome collection here. And you can just hover over and you can see all the adjustments. Some work for um, kind of certain styles of images, like I've got ones that are specific for night style of images and others that are more daytime related. Um, and I go through and I can just kind of browse how my pre-existing edit styles would work. Uh, and then from there, I can tweak them and, and make adjustments. Um, so these are sort of like some of the, the styles that I kind of have in my um, consistency. Uh, but I'm going to show you how I'd go through if it was completely start to scratch. So first of all, I'm going to yeah. uh, just kind of play around with my exposure. Um, and mainly I'm going to be targeting the foreground first. I'm actually going to come back to looking at the sky later. Uh, so I'm actually just going to brighten the foreground just a little bit. And again, uh, in this case, I'm going to increase the contrast ever so slightly. But then I'm going to bring down the highlight. And you can see this is where we're targeting like the sky and kind of looking around uh, the mountain over here. Um, so I can bring it all the way down, but that's a little, a little too strong and increase the shadow. So we're sort of kind of flattening things a little bit in preparation for when we get to the tone curve. That's where I add the character. Um, and likewise, bringing up the white point uh, just kind of helps make the image pop a little bit. So the difference between the highlights and the white point is the highlights is kind of like a whole area of your bright areas. Uh, and then the white point is almost like the very tip of that highlight adjustment. Um, you know, at what point are you raising the, the whitest of points and likewise the blacks and the shadows. Um, so immediately we can just see uh, if we tap the backslash, you can see those adjustments that I've made. So it's just kind of given a bit more pop to those image. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit of clarity, which is just adding that micro contrast. Um, this image is fine for haze, um, but to give you an idea of what it can do, uh, you see it just reduces that haze um, towards the distance. You can cook it a little too far if you're not careful. Um, and it's great for areas that have got a lot of um, pollution and smog. Uh, you can sort of get through that um, sort of in the distance. Uh, in fact, I use dehaze an awful lot on my Hong Kong images. Such a good algorithm. Yeah. Um, Vibrance wise, uh, I'm just going to increase the vibrance, just sort of draw out more of those pinks in the sky. Um, saturation, I could do a little bit, but you see how it's kind of, it's just going a little too much on these buildings. I don't really like that. So I think I'm actually going to come back to that as a gradient filter. 
Um, so now we get into the fun with the tone curve. And the way that I like to work in this is I start with uh, my midpoints. And so I just start with a, a point there and I can just drag it down and just work um, ever so slightly into what I feel looks best. Uh, and then I'll go for the midpoint of that point. So I go to the midpoint of the shadows. You see how I can just drag those shadows down. I don't want to go too far with this. Um, and then I could go slightly and I'm just sort of methodically going halves and halves and halves uh, on the way that I work. Um, and I could raise the blacks ever so slightly. And that just kind of gives a tiny bit of um, sort of softness to some of these darker areas. So it just sort of means that the purest blacks are never fully black. Yeah. Uh, you can push it too far. Um, and some people like that as a, as a style. It can be quite trendy, but also it can very quickly lose its um, sort of appeal. Uh, likewise, I'm going to bring the highlights ever so slightly. And I could, again, overdo it. Um, but I just know that in an hour or two, I'm not going to enjoy that. <laughs> so <laughs> drop that down and then just drop the highlights ever so slightly. So in terms of a tone curve, that's a very odd looking shape. Um, it's a bow. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it looks very minimal. Um, but if we were to turn this adjustment on or off, which one is it? This one. Um, it's kind of minute, but it's, yeah. it's enough to have a, a kick of character to it. Um, and likewise, I can go into the individual colors. Um, so reds ever so slightly, I'm just gonna make adjustment. When I do my color ones, I very rarely go minute on my adjustments. So I keep it quite limited. Um, and it's actually just the reds and the blues that I wanna target in this. I'm just gonna increase the blues because I like that, that colder sort of style. I think it gives a, a crispness. Um, I could go again too far, I could bring it back. Um, and if we turn that on and off, we can now see overall the color that I've done. And then into our HSL sliders. Um, so I want to just accentuate the pinks just to see how it looks. Uh, this may not work, by the way. So if I just click and drag, and we raise it up. It's actually doing a pretty good job of that. Um, so it's just, you see, raising the saturation of the reds and the magentas. Again, if we just backslash before and after, um, I'm pretty pleased with that. I might just you are very the light pieces. touch with these. It's really nice. That, that... Yeah, I think the the key to um, editing images is, is to be so gradual in your approach. Uh, it can be so tempting when you first get started to just be like, yeah, sliders all the way. <laughs> um, but that's maybe not going to help you in the long run. Uh, but likewise, when I look back on images that I edited like 15 years ago and I see how I edited them, uh, I just shake my head in, in horror. Um, but I think if you're not looking back on your images in that way, you're likely not improving. So I take it as a good sign that um, my previous work was uh, a bit of pants. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna adjust too much here. Um, perhaps the, the luminance, I may just bring these pinks down just to kind of bring back some of the exposure, but I can see it's actually having a negative effect on the top of the mountain. I'm not too happy with that. So I'm actually not going to adjust it too much. It's pushing the file a little too far. Um, so it's going to reset that back. Uh, split toning. Uh, again, we can kind of play around with this. So the way that I usually play if I'm looking to experiment is I'll increase the saturation, say, to about five, and then I'll just drag my highlights throughout you can see how it's having a bit of an effect. So I think I actually want to cool down some of these highlights. So again, I'm looking in primarily in this area. Um, so I'm sort of like dragging that and you can go from like a greeny hint, uh, hue hint or hint if you want to merge them. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, adjust the saturation. And likewise, the shadows, this is going to be targeting mostly this area. Uh, I may just want to warm those a little bit. So let's push that there and yeah i'm pretty happy with how that's looking uh sharpening we've already got some default settings just going to increase the masking so we're not encroaching on our neighbor's fence <laughs> and noise wise uh there is a little bit of noise here let's bring back some of the detail 
And all right. Uh, cool. Let me jump on. Looking lovely. The uh, the transform. So I could just hit the auto and just let Lightroom analyze the image and smash one out. Um, and it's actually done a pretty good job. So from standard, you can see it's just kind of tweaked it ever so slightly on the rotation. And I always look to the edges of the image as my sort of guide point. Buildings, you'd hope, are built vertically. Um, so I think I can trust those. Um, and that looks pretty great. You can see like the edge of the window is nicely aligned all the way down. Um, we don't have too many buildings over here, but again, uh, we kind of got those. It's maybe a little bit bowing over there. Um, but on the whole, I'm pretty happy with that. If I want to do manual adjustments, I can adjust my verticals here. Uh, and by keeping constrained crop, you see that any of those sort of white excess areas on the top left of the frame, so they will get zoomed in. Mm. Um, I'm just going to undo those because that is ruining the image. Uh, you can add a tiny bit of grain. This image already has a bit of uniform noise over it, so I'm, I'm not going to go too far on the grain. I'll drop the size down a bit uh, and decrease the roughness so it's not too strong. Um, and in terms of calibration, I'm actually pretty happy with how overall we're looking. Um, I'm just going to do a couple of little tweaks. But that's kind of where we have it. And now, as I've got to the end of the image, that's usually where I'll scroll back up and just make some further tweaks. I'm kind of thinking that areas of the, the buildings over here, the shadows are a little bit too dark, so I'm just going to raise those ever so slightly. If I wanted to, I could go into my uh, gradient filter, draw down over the sky, bring down the exposure a little bit, bring the highlights down a bit, decrease the contrast. Um, and again, I can turn this on and off to see what it is that I've done. So yeah. it's kind of stop this burning out a little bit on the top. And I could do the range mask with the luminance. And this is kind of cool. So this is where it's going to say only affect a certain part of your image of a certain luminance. Um, so with the range, at the moment, it's got a range of 100% of the brightness scale of this image. If I bring up the left part uh, to say 50%, if you imagine a scale from black to white, uh, as your sort of brightness, this is now only going to make adjustments on anything that is gray and upwards to white. Uh, and if we hover over the image, you'll see that it's no longer a perfect sort of red mask over the whole image. There are areas, particularly with the buildings, um, that aren't being affected by this mask. And I can tweak it even further so I can adjust that luminance to really only affect the bright portions. Um, and that just sort of softens the barrier. Because uh, if we were to do it poorly, if we were to take this off completely and drag this over um, and say, bring down the exposure. You notice how the space needle just goes from dark to, to light. Um, yeah. And that's not natural. That That's kind of a bit doomsday looking. So Are you going to brush that out? Will you, will you brush that out from the gradient? Will you? Uh, generally, I don't really do that um okay. i could do on a on a tiny amount but yeah. for the most part i try and keep my gradient filters as subtle as possible so that i don't need to do those sort of elements um but it could be done you could you could go in and and remove like extra details of those um and that would be with your brush tool over here but yeah i think uh i think this is looking pretty good um yep. and if we go back to our original so I edited. Overall, it's still a very subtle shift and change, um, but the image still retains its natural characteristic. It was a very pink sky as we were there. Um, it's just kind of popped a little bit more of the brightness um, to kind of give it some some clarity overall. And uh, I'm actually really happy with how that would look. If we go back to our library, and let's see how I previously edited it to see what the difference is. So this is what we've done today, and this is how I did it last time. Yeah. So with a little bit more time and care, um, on my previous edits, I'd kind of narrowed some of my um, adjustments into... So I've darkened the bottom. Let's have a little look what I've done. I think I've probably got a gradient filter 
Yeah, yeah it looks to be to the top the as well, I think, as well, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that, funnily enough, that's what Gareth uh, was just asking in the chat. Like any creative, how do you know when you're done with an image? When do you stop? <laughs> when would you stop adjusting? Um, I don't know. I mean, in today's terms, it's because uh, we're on a time limit with the yeah. screen. <laughs> yeah, of course. Talking of which, we've got but, about about six minutes yet left. So, if you want to get your questions in, now would be a good time. And yeah, don't definitely. forget. Also that uh, we have our Discord, so you can join us on our Discord and the chat can continue beyond uh, the end of the stream as well. Thanks, Tim, for popping that into the chat. Amazing. Right. Anyway, sorry. Carry on, Joe. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so this is kind of like a... That was a, a very broad overview of, of how I'd uh, adjust some of my images directly. Um, we're doing a stream again tomorrow, uh, so I can go through again just to kind of continue on some different editing styles uh, within Lightroom. But also, uh, there's a lot that I do in terms of my organization and structure um, with my Lightroom library. So you probably notice up here, I'm browsing by metadata on all of my images. If I was to take off my keywords, for example, um, and various other uh, attributes to my images and zoom out, we're then looking at uh, a lot. Let's turn off that. Hold on. Why am I only looking? Ah, it's because I'm in a collection. Uh, but if we were to go to, say, all of my locations, um, we've got a whole host of images here. And I think the, the organization structure um, that I've worked with, hopefully there's some value in there that I think people would find interesting. So we can perhaps go through some of that tomorrow. Um, yes. If you're interested in absolutely uh, i think yeah yes definitely yeah um but yeah if, if anyone's got any particular questions on things uh happy to go through and let's have a quick look because the chat has been busy i've got to tell you as well um when we mentioned the fish market earlier it it led to a whole load of fish based puns which uh, were very good uh, my favorite was uh, i tuna out for a minute there <laughs> Which is really good. Uh, by the way, I also want to apologise for the noise. That's actually at my end, uh, the grinding that's going on there. I have tried to mute uh, in between, but apologies. Uh, for that, uh, let's have a quick look. Um, so John uh, feels he gets to the point when, he's, when his edit is complete. He steps away from the screen for a few minutes, then comes back and look again. Uh, for a balanced view of the edit. I do that myself, actually. How about you, Joe? Do yeah. you do that? Step away? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, sometimes, not even intentionally. It's a case of, you know, you um, you just grow to grab a drink or, or something like that. And when you come back and you're either... You quite often do have a change of opinion. Uh, it could be that you were kind of feeling a bit sluggish before. And you're like, oh, you know, I've just been editing 30 or different images. Uh, and you come back and you think... Actually, no, these images are great. I, I want to be working on them more. Or you can come back and think, what on earth was I doing? Um, <laughs> you've just kind of gone too far on things. Um, but likewise, seeing them the following day uh, really has an effect. Um, and I think in the way that, because I'm quite often editing these photos and putting them into videos and editing the videos, collectively, they are all telling a story of consistency. Um, and as I've adjusted, say, uh, the start of my images, gone through a whole batch towards the end, my idea of what it is that I'm trying to tell with those images as a, as a story can change. And then I'll go back to the original ones and I'll adjust them so they all fit as the same sort of style of collection. Right. And likewise, I'm, as I'm editing the video, I want that to have a similar sort of feel to it. Um, and overall, that is a lengthy process that can take, you know, five days, a week or, or whatever. Um, but I do think that is what kind of helps bring it all together. Um, and I, I guess it, it helps Cohesion. change your opinion. Yeah. 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 You're remarkably intuitive because you're actually, you're, you're managing to hit the questions just before they're actually asked. Um, Sean, <laughs> Sean, I think, was just saying a moment, a moment or so ago about the similarities between that and grading uh, yeah. in uh, video. Uh, there was a question actually from Kirsty about retrieving a catalog from Lightroom if Lightroom has had a problem. Have you uh, ever had that with a catalog that's crashed or 
Never with a catalog directly. Um, but in fact, I did actually have a, a thing happen earlier today that I thought would be an interesting discussion point where because I'm referencing these images as my archive from my um, server, hmm. when I opened up the library earlier this morning, uh, there was a lot of images that weren't referenced because I guess the last time I'd opened it is when I had these files stored locally on an external drive. Yeah. Um, and the way that I reference my images back um, was made so much easier by the fact that at the time I imported the images, I always do a renaming structure of every file that goes into it. So every file, mm -hmm. rather than it just being, um, what would it be, dscf3229.raf, um, okay. I'm actually renaming it to the reverse date, then the camera model, then the destination, and then the file name. Um, so if we're looking on the screen now, I don't know if it's up on there just yet. Um, but this reverse date and file naming just made it so much easier because immediately finding those images that were lost, I knew exactly which folder to look in because it, it was already named for me. Right. Um, and likewise, cameras themselves can quite often reset their numbering when you reach 10,000 images. Uh, so looking for DSCF 001, you may have four results for it. Um, so putting that reverse date really helps. Uh, in terms of a, a whole catalog that's been lost, I've never really had that as an issue. Mm. I know that if you open Lightroom and hold the option key, I believe, uh, you can choose your catalog and you can have the option to repair yeah. catalogs that may be damaged. Oh, well, there you go. That might help, Kirsty. That would be really cool. Yeah. So I think we're going to talk a bit more about organization and we can certainly discuss uh, reverse date notation uh, tomorrow. I think that's what that's the plan for tomorrow, right? We're going to look a bit more at yeah. the... Yeah. Yeah, we'll do um, some more admin and uh, I guess some of the efficiency stuff that I... I love well, the boring stuff that's highly important. It, it is. And actually, I'm, I'm a fan of that myself because I think it's the stuff that saves you wasting your time. Uh, once you've got a structure for doing things, then you can go ahead and, uh, and do the bit that's important, the creative bit. Excellent. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's it. We're at time uh, today, uh, Joe. It's been great having you along and watching you work. Everybody's loved that. Uh, great start to the week, says Gareth. Uh, great, says Catherine. Uh, thank you, says Kirsty. So they're all loving that. And uh, looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. I hope to see you all there as well. Fantastic. Well, that's it for today. Uh, back with myself and Joe tomorrow, as I said just a moment ago, several times. So uh, no excuse now for not turning up and seeing us. Don't forget, <laughs> join us in the Discord uh, if you want to. Uh, but for me, with my 2,000 pencils and a brontosaurus, uh, that's it. Take care now. Stay creative. <laughs> See you later.